record. So I think it is recording now. And I just want to say hi and welcome. So my name is Angie Kultoff. I am up in Minnesota and I have my awesome Texas mug with me today because my co-presenter Becky isn't able to be here with us. So I am going to do the presentation alone and try to fill in as best as I can with the parts that Becky would have shared. But Becky's a teacher in Texas and I am a former teacher in Minnesota um, and now work at Capstone. While I was a teacher, I, I was the teacher that thought I was annoying and would always reach out to the ed tech companies and say, hey, I want to try this or like, have you thought of this or have you done this feature? And I thought I was bugging them. But now working at Capstone, I love that. I want to talk to teachers and I want that feedback. So if you're um, an educator and you have feedback, we want to know. It's it's great for us. So Becky and I met out in um, Rhode Island at the Infosys Pathfinders Institute last year in February, so right before the pandemic hit. And um, sh she came to my session on using the Kibo robot and Scratch Junior in early childhood classrooms to teach computer science. Um, so that's how we met. And we decided at that Infosys Pathfinders Institute in person that we had a lot in common and that it would be fun to do some projects together and stay in touch. So we did. And we ended up doing this virtual robotics club together, which is all about the session today. Uh, but one of the sessions, if you are interested more in learning about Dash from Wonder Workshop, which I'll be highlighting today in this session, um, they have another session coming up this summer in July in the online version of the Infosys Pathfinders Institute. And I think Becky was able to get most, if not all of hers paid for through Donors Choose um, and the Infosys Foundation. So if you're looking for more in-depth PD or if you have the Dash robot and you just want more time to get hands-on with some of the projects, I would highly recommend checking out that professional development opportunity. So here I am and here's Becky. So this is what I plan to cover today. Um, we have a lot of information to share now because our club is um, over for the year. And so we just, we wanted to make sure to tell you everything from how we set it up to how we funded it, to how we taught the different computer science concepts and use the robots um, and what we learned along the way. So if at any time you have questions during the presentation, put it in the chat and I'll be trying to check the chat as I go along for the session. So uh, we wanted to start with our why. So um, in the school district, the HEB school district where Ms. Hansen, Becky and Ms. Garcia work, uh, there are students who are in a virtual only situation for the school year. And we wanted to have a chance for them to participate in an after school club. So Ms. Hansen wrote a grant to, um, to fund this club. And we had elementary students from two different elementary schools in our club. And all of our students received uh, a Dash robot. So the grant was able to provide students to have a Dash robot to, to use during the club, but also to keep it after the club and continue learning on their own. And then we did a bunch of unplugged activities, meaning they didn't need to have any technology in order to do these activities other than their Chromebooks because we did this all over Google Meets because it was our virtual club. Um, we also used the Blockly app and Class Connect to manage all of our student coding work and I'll show you what that looks like. And we use Capstone Connect um, with our content. So Capstone Connect, I'll go over that in a minute, but we use different eBooks and different PubliGo and PubliGo Next articles to support the concepts our students were learning in our unplugged activities and in um, the coding activities that they were doing with Dash. And our club met every Tuesday from 3.30 to 5. And some Tuesdays, we had a guest speaker uh, join us online and talk about their experience. And I'll share more about that as we go. So at the Infosys Institute that Becky attended with me, um, one of the things we talked a lot about is some research done by Dr. Marina Umashi Bears out of Tufts University in, in the Boston area. And she talks a lot, a lot about learning environments for children and if they are a play pen type environment or a playground type environment. So in the chat, 
I would love to see some words that come to mind when you think of a play pen. So go ahead and put in the chat. What are some words that you think of when you think of a play pen? And on my screen here, you see a, a young child in a play pen. So um, for young children, like a toddler, it's a confined space. They have um, a purpose. They're great for like a, a little bit of time, but you don't always wanna end up in there forever. Um, and then what are some words you think of as a, when you think of a playground? Oh, I see another chat come in. So a playpen is not free to choose or learn as needed for each student. And when you think of a playground, you think of freedom and free play. Okay, so we got, we kind of got that picture in our mind, open space, multiple areas. They're learning, they may not get something right the first time, but they can get up and they can try again. It's usually loud and there's interaction. And so Dr. Bears in her research talks about what type of um, tools people and children are using and whether that's a play pen or a playground type environment. And so we wanted to be able to emulate both the playground and the play pen in our virtual club setting. And neither of us had uh, ever taught a virtual club. So it was a, a new experience for both of us. Another piece of research that came out of Tufts in the DevTech research group with Dr. Bears is the positive technological development framework. So if you're bringing technology into your elementary settings and you're wanting to think deeper or maybe in other ways about how you're using it and what you wanna get out of using it, there are some behaviors here that she dives into deeper and what they look like with classroom practice. Um, I've been working on a, a blog series with a former student and um, current employee at Tufts. Her name is Dr. Amanda Strahacker, and we have been breaking down each behavior in the PTD framework and talking about what different um, activities look like and at home and at school during the during teaching during the pandemic. And then the DevTech website has a ton of research. So if you're trying to make a case for bringing um, different types of technology activities or robotics or computer science or computational thinking into your learning space, DevTech has a bunch of research for you that you can dig into and help make that case. And we'll share out this presentation on our capstone site so that you can um, have access to these links after the presentation. So just to jump into funding a little bit more. So Becky was able to attend the Infosys Foundation Pathfinders Institute and spent, I think it was three or four days learning all about Dash, the robot that we used in our club and different types of challenges and activities that she could do as a teacher with her students. And Donors Choose was how she funded that. And the Infosys Foundation had matched a lot of the um, donations that came in for her. And then her school district that she works in, the HEVIC Education Foundation, awarded her a grant of about $3,800. And that's what allowed us to buy the Dash robots. So each learner in our activity in our club got to keep their robot. And then they used their school issued device to program their robot. And they were using Chromebooks, as well as different unplugged materials. Um, they each learner got a bag of unplugged materials before we started, uh, before our parent kickoff meeting. And I'll talk more about that in a minute, but they were able to keep everything because of that donation. So it was really helpful for us to have um, both of those funding sources to kick off this club. So this is our daily schedule for our club. So I mentioned before, we went from 3.30 to 5.00. And just to break it down and kind of try to show you what we did. Um, we also learned that less is more. And we had um, all these grand ideas and things that we wanted to do. But it was a completely virtual club. And we were using Chromebooks and the Dash robot and things didn't always go the way we planned. So we ended up having to cut some stuff out sometimes. Uh, but we did try to give ourselves a buffer at the beginning so as students entered we could troubleshoot any technical issues as learners were reading their own ebooks um, on their computers. Then we would have a poll of some kind and it sometimes was related to the book they read, 
Sometimes it wasn't, and I'll show you some examples. Then we would do an unplugged activity. And during that unplugged activity time, we were really trying to help students connect with new words or strategies without having to do um, a coding activity with their app. Um, then we would move into coding with the Dash robot in Dash's neighborhood um, or in the Class Connect area. And then we'd come back together and close out as a whole group. And some days we had guest speakers and the days that we didn't have guest speakers, they were just able to continue coding and have more time to work. So I'm gonna pause just real quick and see if anyone has questions in the chat. I haven't seen any new ones come in yet. Feel free to send them at any time, but I will keep going and check back in in a little bit. So our club, we planned it to be seven weeks. And this is the, stru the structure we used as we were um, brainstorming and planning how our club would go. We wanted to start with that, a get to know you type question because we had students from two different schools coming together in our online virtual club. They didn't all know each other. So we wanted to have some type of opening activity. We had different books or Pebble Go articles to support those vocabulary words. Like you see here about debugging or how computers work. Um, then we had some unplugged activities. A lot of the unplugged activities we had were from code.org. So they were free to use and activities that I've done in person in classrooms when I was a teacher. But this was my first time trying them online in a virtual environment with students. Then we would have a challenge and our whole theme was about um, the pandemic and a grocery store and how a robot could help us during this time. And our robot was Dash. And then we had some reflection or check-in questions and an area for students to show their evidence or to show off their projects. And in that case, we used Flipgrid for them to easily share some videos. So this was our, our process. We started with Discover, and that again is using the different eBooks and Pebble Go articles, and then Engage. And that's where we were having them chat with each other, chat with us, um, try out the different unplugged activities and hands-on coding experience with Dash, and then Share is where we used Flipgrid to have them share out their projects or their um, videos of their robots doing the code that they wrote. So I've talked a little bit about Class Connect, but I'm gonna show this video. I'm gonna to try to show it and hope that my sound works. I didn't get the little button to check to share my sound when I came in. So I'm hoping it works. I'm gonna push play and then I'm gonna look over and see if anyone can give me a, a thumbs up or a head shake if you can hear the volume. You're a teacher. You spend hours every week finding resources for your students. The right resources. You gather it. You send it. They click it and get an error. Or have to create yet another login and password. They get frustrated. Their caregivers get frustrated. And you get frustrated. There is an easier way. Introducing Capstone Connect, your one-stop content hub, where you can quickly and easily search and share educationally appropriate, highly engaging Capstone content. Capstone Connect gives you instant access to Pebble Go, Pebble Go Next, Pebble Go Spanish, Pebble Go Read More, Capstone Interactive's collection of eBooks with read aloud audio and hundreds of other digital learning resources designed for use by both teachers and students. With Capstone Connect, you have thousands of content pieces that are matched to state and national standards right at your fingertips. No matter what ed tech tool you're using, you can give your students direct access to Capstone Connect's content with just a few clicks. Here's how it works. Once you've signed into your Pebble Go account, simply click the Capstone drop-down menu and select Search. Here you can search by either state and national standards or by title and get instant results. 
which you can organize by type, and also preview each item to find the exact content you're looking for. Then just copy the link and directly add it to any EdTech platform to give your students one-click access. No new logins or passwords required. Connecting your students to great resources has never been easier with Capstone Connect. Go to capstoneconnect.com and click request more information to be contacted by your local Capstone representative. Okay, so uh, we use Capstone Connect as a way for us to find the resources relevant to the TEAK standards and the different topics that we were teaching. Um, I'm just curious in the room here, has anyone used Capstone resources? Have you used Pebble Go or Pebble Go Next or Capstone Interactive eBooks or Capstone Connect? Can you type in the chat uh, what resources you've used? I, you could also try to unmute, but I think there was an issue with trying to unmute. If you're able to unmute, go ahead and unmute and tell me. Otherwise, just type it in the chat. So Pebble Go, Pebble Go Next, um, Capstone Interactive eBooks or Capstone Connect. Just curious. I'll pause for a moment. Okay, so we do have some Capstone users in here. That's awesome. So what Capstone Connect is, it's um, a newer product of ours that just does what it says it does. It connects everything. So as the adult, as the teacher or the librarian or the media specialist or the principal interventionist, as the educator, you can log in and you, you have a way to search all of your eBooks your Pebble Go articles, your Pebble Go Next articles, and your instructional materials or like lesson plans in one place, either aligned to the standards, and in this case, you could search by Deeks, or you could search by the title. So this is what it looks like. So when you go into Connect, you have the choice by standard or title. And when you pick one, this is what you would see. So up here, you see the Teak standard, and then you can see all of the different resources that are correlated to that standard. And as the instructor, I can easily just click this copy link button and then put it into whatever tool I'm using with students. So it could be Canvas or it could be um, a Google slide or in our case, we use Google Sites quite a bit or Flipgrid. And when students clicked on that link, they automatically got brought into that book without having to sign in. So they had that direct one click access. And that's what Capstone Connect helps you do. Find the resources that you're looking for either by standard search or by title, and then get that really easy copy link button so that you can share it with your learners and get them into it simply without having to remember a username or password. If you have any questions about Capstone Connect, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, do you just see the resources you own? Yeah, if you are a Capstone Connect customer, you only see the resources that you have access to as a Capstone Connect customer. So like I just said, it takes um, your CI books and your Pebble Go articles and Pebble Go Next articles and brings it into one place and gives you that really easy copy link feature just for what your account has access to if you're a Capstone Connect customer. Uh, so now I'm gonna move on to a little bit more about the club setup and what it looked like. Uh, so our first, very first meeting was a family meeting. So before the club even started, we had the students and learners join a Google Meet with their, their family or guardians, and we went over what the club was all about. Um, we talked about how they could communicate with us, and um, Ms. Hansen and Ms. Garcia use talking points as a way to communicate with families. We went over expectations for the Dash robot and how in their homes they get to come up with the rules together but we gave them some tips as to what kind of rules or expectations we would have in school with the robot. Uh, we had them all hold the robot in their hands and explore the robot with us as we pointed out different features and we were really lucky to have someone from Wonder Workshop which is the company that makes Dash join us so he was able to give more specific information and ask or answer questions from families that we may not have been able to answer. Then we had them watch a video about pair programming. 
because we wanted to encourage um, more than one person using this robot at home, whether it was the learner and their um, adult guardian or another sibling, but we wanted to have them understand what it looked like to pair program and work together when you're programming a robot. And that's uh, the video we used was from code.org just on YouTube. Then we also had them log into their Class Connect account. And I'll show you more what Class Connect looks like in a little bit, but that's where they actually did their programming for their Dash robot. So we had them log in and make sure that it worked um, and that they could all do it together. And we showed them our website. So I'm not an HEB ISD employee, so I'm not, I wasn't able to use Canvas with Ms. Hansen and Ms. Garcia. So we just put all of our resources on a password protected Google site. And each day we had a different page. So we made sure to show our families how to get there because that had all of the information that they would need. And then the first day of our club, we worked together as a group. So our, our students from both of the elementary schools um, in our online club, we, taught, we set club guidelines together. We wrote a mission together. We went through what we would do daily and what would be different. And every day we thought about how robots can help us and we went through our objective. We also went through our website and on our website, we had really easy access for students to get to an ebook shelf of all of our Capstone Interactive eBooks. Um, we had some free choice reading time and we encouraged them to read some of these books outside of club time. But then during our club, we also had specific books to read because we had questions or because they helped teach a concept. Um, on our club website, we learned, I think by week two, that it was really helpful to put some um, videos on here to help kids that maybe something we said during our club didn't stick with them. So they would ask a few times and we wanted to keep moving on during our club. And so we just recorded ourselves ahead of time showing how to do certain things that we were trying to anticipate they might have questions on. So that was also on our club website. And if you have Capstone Interactive eBooks and you use either Google Slides or Microsoft PowerPoint, and you want to create um, an eBook shelf that might look like this, where you can bring in different eBooks and Pebble Go articles, I made a video and it's hosted on our Capstone YouTube channel about creating an eBook shelf with uh, Google Slides and Capstone Connect. And this is what each day would look like on our Google site for our students. So they'd come in and before we would get started, they would see either the ebook shelf or the book of the day. So we would make sure that they'd have time to at least read that book. And if they finished early, they could go to the ebook shelf. Then we had our presentation embedded and they were able to click through it along with us. And then we had our reflection at the end and we used Flipgrid to do all of our reflection or showing of evidence. So each week had a, the same format, but different content um, relating to what we were teaching that week or doing that week. And we also used Pebble Go, like I mentioned before. And in that first week, we, we talked about computer scientists at a very basic level. And in Pebble Go, we have some great articles about computer scientists and um, in the earlier days of computer science and some of the heroes that we might have in computer science like Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper to help students try to understand um, what it was like a few years ago and what it's like today as we're programming and how it's evolved. And this is what Class Connect looks like. This is, um, I've mentioned it a few times, but Class Connect is a hub that our students are able to log into. And then Ms. Hansen, Ms. Garcia, and myself, all of us were in different locations, just like our students. Um, Class Connect gave us the ability to see the code our students were working on and see the optimal code or the suggested code. So if they got stuck, this was a big lifesaver for us because in the classroom, you could just go stand behind them, look over their shoulder and see what they were doing. But you can't do that in a virtual setting. And we found ourselves trying to troubleshoot with students and using Class Connect to see what they were doing. So it was really helpful. So there are puzzles in Class Connect 
that we did and students did them to learn how to program their Dash robot. So it's, if you've used the Dash robot before, actually, let me just check the chat. Has anyone used the Dash robot before? Yes, I've used Dash robot or no, I'm new to Dash robot. Will you just let me know so I know where we're at? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so if you've used the Dash robot before, so far everyone has said yes. Um, if you're in the classroom and you're using your iPad or Chromebook in the Blockly app, there's the whole driving school. Well, they have that driving school in Class Connect as well. So as students are going through those puzzles to understand how to use the blocks to code their robot, in Class Connect, I'm able to see their answers and if they're stuck or what that optimal code is. It also has access to Dash's neighborhood, which you see over here. And this is where it's just like that open environment, free form. You can program Dash to do whatever you want. You don't have to try to solve a puzzle. So we used both the puzzles to get started and understand blocks and Dash's neighborhood. Has anyone here also used Class Connect with, um, with Dash? Or is that a newer tool for us? Okay. Thanks for answering. Oh, Karen, you might have met if the summer summit is the Infosys summit, you may have been there with Becky. If it's not the Infosys summit, then maybe not. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to jump into Dash a little bit more. So Dash is from Wonder Workshop. This is the resource that we used for our, our um, project or our virtual club. And we also did unplugged activities. So that was like after students came in, they got to read their books, then they did some unplugged activities. And that's what we're gonna look at now, how we connected the books and the unplugged activities. So in our first week, we talked about debugging. So our, our new word, our concept was debugging. And we chose that for the first week because we knew we would have to do a lot of debugging in this virtual club. Not only debugging, finding and fixing errors in our code, but debugging with our technology and our environment and our new setting. So code.org has a, a free unplugged activity called um, My Robotic Friend, and you program your friend to make a tower out of cups. And so in that big bag of supplies that all of our learners got before the club started, we gave them some cups that look like this. So we had students in different breakout rooms and they were able to create their own code. Um, at first we had them do it on paper and then we decided to try it with Jamboard so it'd be easier to share. And we learned that having them draw their arrows on a Jamboard and share their screen in their breakout room worked much easier than trying to have them write arrows on a piece of paper and hold it up to the screen. So if this is something that you wanna try virtually, Jamboard worked great for that. Doing it in person, which is what I had done before, we would use um, whiteboards or I'd print out little strips of paper with specific boxes for kids to put the arrows in. So um, they learned how to uh, create their own code with arrows and then their partner through um, Google Meets through the camera would program their cup following their directions. And the debugging came in when they were making their towers, if their tower didn't look like the like it should have based on the person who made the code, they would have to find and fix their errors. And in Capstone Connect, one of the books that is available is all about debugging. And it goes through um, a real life situation where you have to debug, um, not necessarily connected to computer science, but I think this one was connected to a recipe. In week two, our unplugged activity started us off with algorithms. So algorithms was a, a key word for us that we continued on with um, a few more weeks. But this is the week where we decided to try it with Jamboard. So we did that same unplugged activity, which we found to be challenging having them do it on paper and hold up. This week we tried it with Jamboard and it went better. Um, and our book that we used this week was all about how computers work. So trying to understand how computers work and that they run off of algorithms and that's what we would be creating. And Dash was like a computer because it has an input and an output and we were going to be working with Dash and using algorithms to program it. 
In week four, we had unplugged activities again, all about algorithms, but this week we also gave students um, a container of Legos in their bag that they got at the beginning. And there's a whole booklet from the Lego Foundation. It's called Six Bricks Booklet. And there's a ton of activities that you can do with students with only using six bricks. So six Lego bricks. And the activity we did was, can you copy? So again, using breakout rooms, one person in the breakout room would make a structure with their Legos and then hold it up and their peers would have to try to copy that same structure with their Legos. And so we did um, different things like holding it back, holding it forward, um, talking about it, doing it silent to just talk through what situations worked better online, which ones were more frustrating or like what the ideal environment or situation would be so that we could apply that to algorithms making a list of steps that you can follow to finish a task and what that would be like with the dash robot when we're programming. And the book that we read this week was Algorithms Solve a Problem in the Connect, the Capstone Connect um, resource. In week five, we started to talk about conditionals. And we, again, we used a code.org activity called Conditionals with Cards. And this one, you draw a card, and then based on what the card, what card you drew, you would do different points or different actions. So if your card is red, you'd get one point. If it's not red, then it's going to be black in the deck of cards we have. Um, so if it's red, you get a point. Else, meaning it's not red, you then you'd go down here. If a card is higher than nine, you get a point. Else you award your team the same number of points on the card. So we played different card games to talk about conditionals. The book that we read was A Coding Mission by Shannon McClintock Miller. And she is actually a presenter at TLA. So I think she's doing a session on Wakelet. So if you um, haven't met Shannon, she's a wonderful person. I'd recommend um, going and trying to see her presentation or watching it if it, uh, is recorded and you have access to it now. But within the coding mission book, there's a page where they talk about they're going through a maze and they they come to a, a spot where they have to make a decision. And so this is what a conditional would look like in her book. And so then we applied that to our dash robot and I'll show you some of the challenges in a little bit about how we use conditionals to program our dash in our challenges. I did get a, a question that says, are you able to share your slides? Yes, we will share our slides. Not right now during the presentation, but we will put them on our website. So if um, at the end of the presentation, I'll show you how to get to our website. So you'll be able to find them. Okay, so then um, because we were doing this over the past few months, we ran out of a few days and we had some we had some issues. So one week we didn't meet because of the snowstorm. And then another week we did meet, but we had so many tech issues that we weren't able to do all of the things that we planned on doing. <laughs> Does anyone run into issues like that where you're planning to do a lesson or an activity and then something happens and you don't get to do it? Has that ever happened? It's happened to me outside of the pandemic, but I've also had to be um, a little more patient with myself over the past few months with all of this. So these are some things that we wanted to do, but didn't have a chance to do. So another uh, computer science concept that we wanted to spend some time with was loops and code.org has an activity about getting loopy and connecting with music and having kids find different areas or the chorus where it repeats and then calling that out. And then the book, there's a book all about loops. So we didn't get to do this activity, but some students did discover loops as they were coding on their own. And a loop would just make it, would make it easier for students to do a repetitive activity with less code and less chance for error. So it's a great concept to learn. We just weren't able to do it in the amount of time we had. Um, another activity we wanted to do, but we ran into a lot of technical issues that day was this code.org graph paper programming activity where, um, 
you can use words or you can use arrows, but you're teaching students how to go from words to arrows, thinking about algorithms to the code in your program to fill in squares in a graph. And then the book that we were going to use was all about computer programming. Okay, I'm going to pause before I talk more about Dash and see if anyone has questions in the chat about the unplugged activities we did and the books that we used. So just as a reminder, all of the unplugged activities were free and we found the majority of them on the code.org website, but we also used the six bricks books from the Lego, um, Lego Foundation or from Lego for that one copycat one. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat, so I'm going to keep going. So um, Dash was the robot that we used, and we picked Dash because of our, I had used Dash prior with a lot of students in my former school district. Becky had a chance to go to the Infosys Pathfinders Institute online and learn all about Dash um, from somebody at Wonder Workshop who led it. And then the price point we were able to afford a Dash robot for each of our learners in the club. This again is Class Connect, and we were able to see, over here you'd be able to see the student names, and then you'd be able to see the checks. The solid green means great, they did it and didn't really run into any issues. The orange means like, we need some attention here, we're stuck. And the light green means, I think that was the one that meant they were there either right now or well, now that I'm saying it, I don't want to give you the wrong information. I don't remember what the light green means, um, but we can look into that if you have questions. So we gave them time to go through these different puzzles to make sure that they understood how to program Dash, could use the tools available to them before we jumped into the actual challenges where it was, there really wasn't a right way to write the code. So as teachers, we were able to just click on the student, click into a square, see their code, see the optimal code and understand where they were at. It was really helpful, especially in this virtual environment. So these are the challenges that we had students working on. We talked about how we currently are living through a pandemic and not everyone can go to a grocery store right now. So what if we had robots in our daily lives? How could they help us? Um, so. We, we worked with Dash and set up a grocery store in our homes and we worked to program Dash to go to that grocery store for us and get the supplies that we might need. So our first challenge was to actually just make space in your house and either use things that you have in your house or some of the things from the paper from the bag that we sent before the club started and design a grocery store. Lay things out in your room to make a grocery store the best that you can. And then see if you can program Dash to drive around your grocery store. So that was our week one challenge. Our week two challenge was to then capture your Dash driving through the grocery store and in like a path um, and make a video of Dash driving through your grocery store and submit it to Flipgrid. So we we allowed students to either take a picture or a video, and then we encouraged them to comment on each other's pictures or videos. We also had them create an attachment. So they got to build an attachment out of anything they had access to, and that attachment should be used to help Dash pick something up or move something in their grocery store. So this is an example of an attachment. And then in week three, our goal was to pick it up and move it, but get it all the way to the cash register. So like, for example, if you wanted a box of cereal, how could your robot um, drive to the aisle where the cereal is, either pick up or push that cereal box all the way over to the register? So as you can imagine, everyone's um, grocery store looked different. So everyone had different code and we wanted them to share the video of their Dash moving and any challenges they ran into so that they could um, troubleshoot together in Flipgrid because it was all virtual. And then challenge four is where our, if 
else statements came in handy because our conditionals, because our challenge was for if Dash would get close to something. So if Dash got close, Dash could say something like, you're too close, you need to be six feet apart. Or Dash could, if Dash realized it was getting too close, it could immediately back up. That one we had a lot of issues with. Um, some of the sensors, it was hard to make those sensors work. And we didn't know why we struggled so much with it, but both our learners struggled with it and as adults, we struggled with it. So we thought maybe it was something with the software or our sensors, we weren't sure. We weren't able to figure that one out. And then, oh, I'll pause. So any questions about Dash or any of those challenges that I just uh, went through? I'll look at my chat for a few seconds before moving on. Yes, I agree. Sometimes not being able to figure it out is the best lesson. We had to do a lot of debugging and, um, and show our patience and our persistence and our problem solving. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. So then we had some guest speakers a few days and our guest speakers came from a variety of different places. So we had our someone from Wonder Workshop come and he spoke to our families at the very beginning um, in our kickoff meeting. We had a software engineer from Target speak to our learners about her position at Target and what she does. And um, I learned a lot in that presentation that I didn't even think about, but all of the different like Target app and website and then the hardware in the stores and the software that they have internally for Target team members. It, um, it, was, a, it was a great learning experience for all and helped us think about different jobs in computer science. And then we had a robotics coach from within the school district come and talk about the opportunities that these students could have in the future. So when they would go on to middle school or high school different classes or clubs that they could join. And then we had Dr. Amanda Sullivan join us who wrote this book, Breaking the STEM Stereotype. And she talked about her job as an educational consultant and um, how as a mom of young children, she is really hoping to help more schools and companies create education, um, educationally and developmentally appropriate tools for young children. And when our engineer at Target joined us, she talked a lot about the software, but also the hardware at Target and how when you work at Target, there's different teams you can work on. And we use this Public Go article to help students understand the difference between software and hardware. And then we just, we were curious and asked them, what one do you think you would like to work on more? Would you like to rather build the resources, the hardware, like the scanners or the checkout machines? Or would you rather build the software, like the app or the web? So I'm going to pause and ask in the chat, what one do you think you'd be more interested in working on? Do you think, are you more of a hardware person or are you more of a software person? What would you have more interest in building? Software, hardware. Oh, we got a split. Um, I did see a question about how many students participated in the club. That's a great question. I would think on average, a daily average, I would say we had about 20 students in our club, um, a few more, a few less each week. And we had three instructors. So we had one teacher from one school, that was Ms. Garcia, and then Ms. Hanson was from a different school. And then I was volunteering as a capstone employee. Um, as part of our volunteer hours, we get to volunteer. So we had three adults, but that allowed for if somebody had a meeting or wasn't able to attend, we always had two adults. So sometimes we had three adults for about 20 students. Sometimes we had two adults. So if you have a follow up question to that, let me know in the chat. And then we just wanted to share a little bit about our experience. So um, we had so we had the Dash robot with Chromebooks and we had a lot of issues with Dash and the Chromebooks. And that's where some of the lost time came or the troubleshooting and debugging. Um, we learned that in the Chrome Web Store, there's an app that you can use, but we didn't necessarily have access to the app on all of our devices. That the Dash robot does need to get updated and the Chromebooks couldn't update them. So they had to find a way to get 
to a, a tablet like a iPad or an iPhone to do some of the updates. Sometimes we would run into glitches or a slow connection or no connection. And that was really frustrating when you're in a virtual club and you're a third grader, you can't get your robot to connect to do the code that you wanted to do. So we had to really work on our persistence. Um, I've taught with Dash in classrooms in the past and we used iPads and I didn't run into a lot of those, those um, bugs or technical glitches with the iPads with Dash, like I ran into this time with Chromebooks and Dash. Just curious in the chat, are you using Dash with iPads or Chromebooks? So let me know Dash and iPads or Dash and Chromebooks or something else. And then did you experience any of the things I just said with the updates or glitches or slow connection? Has anyone else seen that? Looks like we have a lot of iPad users. Okay. But what was really great is we reached out to Wonder Workshop and one of their employees, her name is Abigail, she joined one of our Google Meets and listened to what was going on and then was able to get an engineer in with us who also listened and um, the kids showed them what was happening. So they were able to work with them to try to make it a better experience. So it was really cool that they took the time to do that with us. We really appreciated that. So a few thing, a few more things we learned. Um, when we first set up the club, everyone was super excited to get going. And if you remember the Class Connect screen, there are different challenges. We wanted to have kids do some of the challenges at the same time so we could talk about it. But we had some really eager learners who got in right away after that family meeting and did like the first 20 challenges. So it didn't really work out to have them pair program and do it together. So if that's something that you want to do, maybe lock the challenges ahead of time so that you don't have to reset them so that they can program together. We also learned that um, depending on the size of school district or school you're in, work with your tech support really early to get the Chrome app set up on your devices, just in case you run into any technical glitches or errors like we did. So not all of our Chromebooks were able to have that Lockly app on them at the beginning like we had hoped. Uh, so we had to work around that. Uh, day one, as students came in, we were greeting them and welcoming them and telling them what we were going to do for the day. And then we decided to uh, use the class screen app so that we could have the message up with a timer and just have the message displayed as they came into the room. So we weren't repeating ourselves every few minutes. So that was a great app to use and just have displayed as students came into our, our Google Meet. I mentioned it before when I showed you our website, but having some pre-recorded instructional materials or videos were helpful. Uh, it just helped with the amount of questions. And we tried to predict some of the things that kids were going to run into and make those videos so that we could just refer them to the website to watch the video. And then we would troubleshoot with them if they still were having issues, but there were some things that could just be solved from those videos. We were really lucky because we had three adults sometimes. Sometimes there were just two of us, but even having two was great because then we could have one adult leading the instruction with the majority of the learners. And then another adult could go into a breakout room and troubleshoot tech issues with kids, either one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. So that was, really, that was a really great thing to have. We even had some students who were able to take the lead on helping us troubleshoot some of the tech issues because they had that same issue on their Chromebook with Dash and figured it out. So in that breakout room, they led some of that troubleshooting, which is really cool to see. Um, but if you do have multiple adults as your um, instructors, if you can make them facilitators, that's a great thing to do because then they can also take charge of some of those breakout rooms where we didn't always have that and maybe one person was gone and then that week we couldn't do a breakout room because Neither of the adults was the facilitator. Um, we also talked about doing some guidelines for facilitators in our goal planning meetings because all of us were used to teaching in our own rooms at our own times. And sometimes we would talk over each other or say one thing different than another thing. So we decided that it'd be great to just spend time and figure out and plan ahead of time when that kind of situation would arise. And then try to share all of the resources in one place. So that's why we picked that Google Sites. So there's one URL, one place for this, the learners to go to each week. And it wasn't confusing like 
go to the the ebook shelf now go to the um Flipgrid, now go to the instructional video, now go here. We could just say, go to the website and everything's laid out for you in the same format each week so that they didn't have to try to learn all these different places. So just to recap, our whole process for this virtual club was to have kids come in and discover. So that's where they were learning on their own through the eBooks and um, the Pebble Go articles then engage and that's where we we're doing our unplugged activities and some of our dash challenges and then share and that's where we use Flipgrid to have them share out either a video, a picture or like a screenshot of their code and then comment on each other's work. And that is our whole presentation. Um, I hope I, I did justice to the parts that Becky would have talked about, but if you still have questions and I didn't answer them, um, in a way that made sense to you. Feel free to reach out to Becky on Twitter and ask that same question and see if she gives a better, more in-depth answer. Otherwise, um, we're both on Twitter. You can reach out to both of us. And I think I saw, uh, can we get Capstone Connect trials? Yes. Um, if you want to private message me or just put it in the chat, your email, I will get it to the person who will work with you to get a trial. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Karen and Cynthia. Um, let me know if you have questions. I'll stick around here for a little bit longer. And great, I just got your trial info email and I will send that on to the person. Um, I was also gonna show you, I think, how to get to Capstone Connect. So if you go, you can just do a simple Google search and go to Capstone Connect right here on this website. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see all these different resources. And one of the resources is webinars. So we are recording this webinar. And if all goes well with technology, it will show up on this page. So you'll be able to watch this um, webinar again and view the slides from it. So I'm, as long as it recorded and it saves to my computer and we can get it up here, it will be here. If not, you can reach out to us and we'll try to get it to you another way. I'm going to just copy a few more of your email addresses so that you can learn more about trial and slides and how to get here. Awesome. Thanks for coming. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in. Otherwise, right now I'm just copying your email addresses and I will get them to the person who can reach out to you. Thanks, Karen. You too have a great rest of the conference. Is Capstone Connect webinars the only way to have access to your slides? Michelle, that is where I know for sure they'll go is to this website with the word slides down here. I'm not sure if by coming in to this webinar or if by going to the Capstone booth, you'll be able to have access to the slides, but for sure they'll, the slides will come here. I'll put this in the chat in case that's easier for you to get to it. Any other questions that um, you have or would like to ask? I'm not sure if another session starts at four, but I just want to be mindful of their time in case they are starting at four. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and stop my recording.